HotMovies.com has long been an ethical and affordable place to hashtag pay for some of your porn. Now with Hot Movies Select, customers gain access to unlimited viewings of tens of thousands of additional films from all their favorite studios for the low, low price of $24.95. Visit HotMovies.com, click Select Unlimited, and use promo code MANHORE at checkout so they know who sent you. The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by Alt Playground. APG is more than just a place to find couples to swap with. Alt Playground is a lifestyle community for all non-monogamous and sexually adventurous people to connect and share. And you know I started a profile. Join me over at altplayground.net. That's A-L-T playground.net. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. Shout out to the witches, the wizards, the warlocks, and everyone who could give us the spell for female orgasms but won't. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Yeah, you know, you could just tell us how to do it. It doesn't have to be this difficult. (laughs) What's up, everybody? How you doing this week on the podcast? I have got on Sex Witch and the author of Sex Witch, Sophie St. Thomas. And we'll be discussing sex magic uh, shortly with y'all. But first, got an exciting update for y'all on the roommate on the apartment front is I have signed a lease. I'm in, babies. I got a new place, and I will be there in like eight days. I just got to make it another eight days. What other cooking items of mine might disappear in those eight days, I do not know, but I know we can endure. (laughs) We'll certainly be able to endure longer than Illinois did. Hey, bust it, brackets. I'll still be uh, in in, uh, the Bushwick area. I'll just be kind of closer to my old part of the hood and uh and continuing to pay way more than i've ever paid for an apartment so really good time to like buy merch join my patreon hey uh, (laughs) um before i get to this week's guest sophie st thomas i want to share an email with y'all uh this one comes from longtime fan horse sarah she writes yo billy it's your girl so last week i matched with a guy on hinge after a few short exchanges he immediately came at me with Oh, so you seem super cool and open-minded. Maybe you're into some kink and, uh, you know, I'm looking for something a bit specific. Hey, it ain't for everybody. So, like, can I be blunt? And I, of course, was all like, yeah, I'm not judgy and I'm open to things if the chemistry is good. And if it's not for me, hey, then I'll let you know. Which, by the way, I hate this concept of, like, I'm not judgy. We are literally all judgy all the time, nonstop. Judgy is not negative. Judgy means, like, you're taking information and you're making a judgment call, Right? Like, you're judging all the time. It's just a matter of, like, are you judging in the positive or the negative? That's more the situation. And if you're not into it, then you judged it in a negative for you. Anyways, I just hate when people go, like, please don't judge me. I'm saying that is impossible. I am a human being. (laughs) Sarah continues. He said he's basically looking for someone he can be very submissive to. Just to be used to, like, eat pussy and nothing in return. He would love to have something regular, daily, if possible. And my reply was like, well, of course, I love being eaten out. So let's get a drink and discuss so we can see what's up. Well, we've hung out a few times since then, and it's been very great so far. (laughs) Only thing is, I'm very used to being the submissive one. Or in being like in long-term, super vanilla, sexually boring relationships. So I find myself not fully comfortable trying on this femdom role. I, of course, started with some open communication, and I asked him to give me a bit more detail of what he specifically wants while being submissive. He said uh, it could be anywhere from degradation, such as forcing him to be naked or forcing him to sexually please me while never being allowed to take any of his own clothes off. Um, He could be forced to, like, come by only fucking my feet or my legs, stuff like that. He also said it could be just him being told to do random things while not even in a sexual situation. Like, I am emptying my dishwasher for me today. It wasn't sexual for me, but I can't say that wasn't great. And it could also just be, you know, sitting on the floor while I go off and do other activities. Now, I've come up with a few good ideas for some orders. 
Some I've already put into action and some are a, a bit more degrading. So I don't feel comfortable using them quite yet, which smart move, girl, you know, keep, keep the extreme stuff in your back pocket. You want to have those for later. Don't throw out all your good stuff right away. I've also done a little bit of Googling for like beginner femdom ideas, but they're all either. So you want to be more dominant or so you want to be a professional dominatrix. And I really just need something right in the middle. I know you've said that sometimes you lean more subby. Maybe not in the way that this guy does. But I'm wondering if there's like anything specific you'd suggest I try when giving him orders. Maybe things you found specifically hot that a dominant girl has had you do or something you've seen sub guys really enjoy in more of a home setting rather than on like a full on scene in front of others. I'm also a little anxious about coming off as not confident enough while commanding him which I then feel like I won't fulfill his sub needs, like if I'm too nice or polite about it. So are there any suggestions or tips you could give me on how to sound and or be more confident when giving orders? Don't get me wrong. I have no problem taking on the dominant role. It's super hot to me to have him do exactly what I say right when I say it. I'm just used to being a very bratty sub. So I'm trying to turn that brattiness into bossiness. And it is such a weird flip-flop. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around it. Any and all advice is welcome. Thanks for being the best, Sarah. Well, 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 gosh, a baby femdom. You love to see it, right? Right, everybody? You love to see it? I notice a lot of women get nervous to be, like, selfish in bed. Not that there aren't plenty of badass bitches who know exactly how to say what they want when they want it. I get it. But, like, I think a lot of women have been socialized that they're supposed to be the giving person in the bedroom, Right. Even when they're posting on random acts of muff dive on Reddit, which is supposed to be like the most selfish space for vulva people, right? Women will still feel like they need to reciprocate. Oh, well, like I could, I could give you a blowjob too, or can I do something for you? There's a lot of that. Can I do something for you too? Instead of just purely receiving. I've noticed this quite a bit. Not the like, oh, well, now I want to blow you. More like the, I feel bad that you didn't come too. I get that a lot. Even outside of the bedroom, you can sometimes see that like, oh, can I get the tip or maybe I can get us dessert or, or it's like, let me, let me do something that's just for you. And this guy here, he's creating a container when you get to be just incredibly selfish and indulgent and petty. And it, it's all going to be super fucking hot for him. I don't think you need my help very much past just allowing yourself to take and to take with confidence. But hey, you want some ideas, and I'm an ideas man, so let's give this a go. Sexually, I think you'll have no problem making him eat your pussy in just a multitude of ways. You're a smart cookie, and I don't think I just don't think you need help coming up with reasons for him to make you come. The same goes for your typical femdom shit. But when you this is this is one I feel like you might want some assistance with. When you want to get just railed. Like when you don't really want to be the dom, but you just want your boyfriend to fuck you good. You can make him do that. Making him service top or making him fuck you hard or fuck you, let's say, out of character. So maybe fuck you like he's the dominant, even though he's doing it because you said that is a form of submission. You can turn sex acts that seem submissive for you to do into dominance. Let's take sucking dick, for example. Sucking dick doesn't have to be him fucking your face. It doesn't even have to be like when he wants. It doesn't even have to be for the purpose of him coming or even for the purpose of him getting an erection. You could just look him in the eyes at some point when you're feeling eager to please. And you can just say, take your fucking cock out. Then get on your knees. Start sucking him off. Don't even look up at him or pay him any mind. Just like be focused on on, on the dick sucking in this confident way. Because even if if secretly you want to just make him feel good in a way you're traditionally used to, make this about you sucking a dick rather than him getting his dick sucked. You want to mind fuck him? Okay, cool. Stop when you feel like you've had enough dick in your mouth, but before he comes. You want to be degrading. When you're tired of tucking your teeth in, send him to the corner. Tell him to jerk off to, or till you, you know, tell him to come back. Or you can send him to the bathroom to come in the toilet. And then we get into this whole like house servant role of submission because then you can tell him to clean your bathroom while he's in there. You see what I'm doing? Like you can, you can pivot things. You can all, you can change stuff. Just you tweak it a little bit. And all of a sudden something that, you know, giving a guy a blowjob, 
doesn't seem very dominant, doesn't seem very in charge. But like I have had my dick sucked quite a bit where like it was not about me getting my dick sucked. This was about her wanting something, taking it when she wanted to. And because I'm a good boy, I'm going to get hard. I'm going to give her a load when she wants to where she wants it. The non-sexual stuff can feel awkward because like we're not used to telling someone we love or care about to do something so minuscule, like taking out the trash or doing your dishes, especially if you're new to BDSM. If you're if you're very well experienced in BDSM, you're probably very used to that. Because like, look, I did Megan's dishes a lot last year, like a lot, a lot. She does not like to do dishes. I don't think I'm talking out of school when I say that. But I, I usually did them on my own efforts, like as a way to say thanks for letting me stay at your house. If she told me every day to do the dishes, I'd be annoyed. But this guy is telling you to tell him to do the dishes. So take advantage of it. You know, it's like having a free cleaning service and a free door get dash guy and a free repairman and a free sex toy, like all in one. Even like the decision making, which I know many of us do not enjoy doing, especially if we lean more submissive. Maybe we're the types who just do not like making decisions. We don't want to make the call. We don't want to pick the thing. We don't want to pick the restaurant. Like even decision making can be given to him as a task. Do you not like, were y'all going to like hang out, watch a movie one night? You don't really know what to watch instead of getting into the whole, what do you want to watch? What do you want to watch? What do you want to watch? But I'm like, what do you want to watch? Well, I pick these five and you pick three and then I'll pick the one. And then you hate the five and you have to start all right. <laughs> Tell him to pick a movie. Tell him I'm coming over tonight. I want to watch a scary movie. You're going to pick the scary movie. And if the movie uh, is entertaining enough for me, I will put a butt plug in you and I'll call you filthy names while I ride you. Boom. Now, now you got, now you got a date night. I like that. This guy also gave you like several examples of the different types of topping you can do. Start with those and, and then try to think of things like that, you know, make him fuck you, but then make him come only by fucking your feet. Okay, that went well. Well, what's another way you can ruin the orgasm, so to speak? He wants to eat your pussy submissively? Have him clean your cunt with his tongue after you get home from the gym before you take a shower. That's a good one, and I'm sure he's going to fucking love it. I know that can feel icky to you, but because you're also a pleaser, I promise you'll get used to it because you'll just see how fucking happy and sloppy he gets ripping your yoga pants off. And hey, if he likes cleaning you, well, then next time you can make him draw you a bath with rose petals and Prosecco, and then like he will clean you like a queen. Take some of the things he's given you, do them, find things that are similar to them, or add twists to those. You'll start getting an idea of what you're digging, what you're not digging, what he's digging, what he's not digging. Because it sounds like he's communicative and experienced enough that he can speak up if you go too far, or if you're not going far enough. Which, when I'm like, being a servicey dom, uh, going not far enough is definitely more of my issue than going too far. Uh, but I'm also going to throw this out to the audience, audience people, femdoms out there listening. What tips do you got for Sarah, either for how she can like really mm, reclaim that confidence and turn that brattiness into bossiness, or if you have any really good suggestions for shit she can make her new sub do, whether it's non-sexual or interesting spins on being demanding in bed throw them at me shoot me an email send them on over to manhorpod at gmail.com uh, and you can send your comments your questions your criticisms all on over to manhorpod at gmail.com uh, i read all the emails respond to all of them i uh, love hearing from you uh, and you know right after you send me that email you can also head on over to apple Podcasts. you can leave me a five-star rating and review uh, I know they seem like dumb score stats, but they actually do help people uh, find the show. It also helps people decide if they want to give the show a try. Like, I think my most recent Apple podcast review is from 2020. So I feel like we need something a little more recent to give people confidence to get on in uh, to, to enter Fan Horn Nation. Would love if you could uh, slip that in. Something you should be slipping into your schedule is uh, this Friday, the monthly man whore munch. Yes, we are playing truth or dare or darer. Uh, <laughs> what's darer? That it's going to be sexual, uh, or at least somewhat R rated. <laughs> but yes, um, uh, every month I have these monthly man whore munches on the Zoom with my seven dollar and up Patreon members. Uh, so much fun. Last month's was a blast. I maybe drank a little too much whiskey. Uh, I maybe didn't make it to the very, very end. 
of Truth or Dare, but from what I was told was the game continued long after I passed out. So if you want to connect with fellow fan horse, if you want to have some fun, if, uh, you know, you're not vaccinated enough yet to go on out and have a fun Friday night outdoors with other people, stay in and play with us. Uh, that is this Friday. I think it's 8 or 9 p.m. Eastern time. Truth or dare or dareer. Dareer. Sign for the $7 and up level uh, at patreon.com slash manhorp podcast to get an invite. Uh, and a real quick fan whore appreciation moment right now to Jane Boone. Jane Boone, that name sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, that is uh, the author of Edge Play and former Man Whore podcast guest herself. Thank you, Jane, for being part of Fan Whore Nation uh, and supporting the podcast you apparently loved being on. So <laughs> uh, thanks for being a member. Thanks for supporting the show. One more time, that URL to support the podcast with as little as $2. That's all it takes to be a good person in this world. I promise being good is like cheap. It's at a steep discount. Have you looked around lately? It don't cost much to be a decent human. <laughs> and in this case, it's $2. And you can do that at uh, patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash podcast. And now for this week's guest, Sophie St. Thomas. Her third book is out right now. Her first two books were about sex and cannabis. This book is about sex and witchcraft. The The book is called Sex Witch, Magical Spells for Love, Lust, and Self-Protection. I've been following this lady on the Twitters for years. She's a good follow. She's a good read. And she's a good podcast guest. Let's do a, we're going to do a couple ad reads and then chat with Sophie St. Thomas. The Man War Podcast is sponsored by altplayground.net, the place to go for your next non-monogamous adventure. And hey, folks, look, monogamous, non-monogamous, swinging, whatever you're doing, the future's looking vaccinated. Shots are getting in arms. I've got some in mind, and I am ready to fucking mingle. And APG is ready to help you mingle as well. They want me to tell you that they are throwing some gatherings in April and May uh, in various places around the country, following whatever the local COVID guidelines are. Um, I will say, you know, we may not want to be gathering crowds just yet, but hey, if you're vaccinated, you're several weeks past uh, your vaccination, you got that that full immunity, you want to go meet some like-minded people in your neck of the woods, uh, you know, go check out the Alt Playground social media channels. Keep your eyes open for announcements about that. They are Alt Playground, the number one on Twitter. And they are at Alt Playground on Instagram. And after you go follow them there, hey, great time to head on over to altplayground.net and make yourself a profile. The Man War Podcast is sponsored by HotMovies.com. Yeah, get them hot, get them movies, hot movies. Uh, it's the pay-per-minute porn site that makes it both an ethical and affordable way to hashtag pay for some of your porn. And right now they're doing, because hey, it's March, and you know the marketing gimmick, we're doing brackets. We're doing who's the hottest porn star on HotMovies.com bracket. Right now they're doing round two which should still be running if you're hearing this soon or they're already on the round three. I want to give a shout out right now to a couple Man Whore podcast alums who are still in it. They're in the round of 32, as we call it. Uh, Sarah J right now, she's up against Lacey Lennon. She could use some votes right now. She's down 26% to 74. And also, oh gosh, the mommy that is so dearest, Penny Barber. Uh, she's in a close one against Isabella Nietzsche or Nice. I don't know how to say her name, but I hope I don't have to learn it because I hope she's going down because it's all about the Penny Barber in this house. <laughs> so head on over to HotMovies.com. Make an account. It's free to sign up. Make an account just so you can participate in the March Madness. And hey, and hey, if you use promo code MANHORE at checkout, you're even going to get 20 free minutes on top of anything you sign up for, which includes the free trial. So sign up, sign up for the free trial, use my code, get free minutes, and then go vote for Penny Barber and Sarah J and some of the other gals uh, competing right now. Hotmovies.com, promo code manhor. Only one. things, if I get lipstick on my face, tell me. Uh, okay. And I Promise. might. Those are fine conditions. I can definitely work within okay, those cool, conditions. Cool, Very cool. reasonable conditions. <laughs> um, quick, but what is, the, I don't even totally understand what the occult technically means it's, we are start we are on i oh, just the occult, I slightly the occult kind of ironically for someone you know writing horoscopes for a lore and publishing books called sex book means hidden knowledge 
it's and, it's like secret knowledge the mainstream isn't supposed to know. Oh, but and, then, oh, and then you were like, I'll write a book and let everyone know. Mm-hmm. Kind of, I was. I thought it might be a little controversial, to be honest, with with like serious occult people. Yeah, some people think like the the conservative folks would take issue. It's like really, no, no, no. The other witches, they they're you're. We're, I'm ratting them out. Yeah, no, it's kind of the same thing. Like with AA, like AA isn't supposed to be discussed in the media at all. So whenever one, anyone writes a recovery memoir, it's slightly convert controversial because the super conservative people in that world are like you're not supposed to be talking about this or our practices or how we do this to anyone else you know but i anyways i have more questions about sex witch or i can talk about aa i'm not an aa but i <laughs> <laughs> but i've gone to a meeting so gone to a meeting? <laughs> I, I i don't drink uh, you don't no okay i'm not sober sober i use cannabis and get ketamine infusions and use psychedelics but i quit drinking when i was 25 but I did start as a child, so I did I did a lot of heavy lifting early on. Why'd you stop drinking? Because so- it made me a homicidal, suicidal monster. In a way that the other drugs did not? Yes. Do you like the drug the the well it depends like i don't do cocaine anymore i was gonna ask i was like yeah. is it certain substances or just not alcohol just but not yeah. alcohol and then i was totally sober for a few years but then i started using medical marijuana for ptsd mm-hmm. as recommended to me by a legit by my psychiatrist who is actually the man i've been in a relationship with for the longest i've been seeing him since 2013 oh, wow. yeah it's very special thank you kept, thank kept you the man, shout, shout out to dr q should you be listening <laughs> um and the, yeah that kind of opened me up to the psychedelic world and kind of alternate methods of healing mm. but you know i grew up in the caribbean and a place where there's technically an 18 year old drinking age but it's pretty much whenever wherever with a history of alcoholism on both sides and i do feel very lucky that my ambition kind of beat my alcoholism so at a time when i was drinking pretty unhealthily i was like i gotta cut this shit out and and i did but just the the traditional 12 step kind of christian based model unsurprising for someone who wrote a book called sex which didn't end up being the best for me so i've taken what's described as what we call a harm reduction model, which is, you know, abstinence, sobriety. Um, the harm reduction model can be applied to everything from sex work to, you know, substance abuse. What is harm reduction model? Literally reducing the harm. So it, instead of being like, okay, you have a problem with alcohol, you have to be completely absent and sober from everything. For some people, it might mean you need to cut back to just one glass of wine a night, you know, or to just drinking every now and then, or don't drink at all. But if cannabis works for you then that's a great alternative and mm. if it helps you not drink even better so it it's a lot more individualized and frankly a lot more based in science as to what actually worked but it's also messier because like you think about what aa says is uh they they might react to that type of thing as oh, like, then oh, it's rationalization do. or you know no, you can't just manage because you're an addict if you if you could manage you wouldn't be an addict or um so so it's like messy because like we it, I don't know. It's not like so clear and cut. It's like it's got to be person to person and just feeling it. And I think, uh, and even today, I, I think I heard, I forgot who I, I heard on a podcast recently say this, but they said like society right now, the way we are online, like we're really uncomfortable with like gray areas, very gray uncomfortable. Area definitions. We don't want to get yelled at. We just want to know the rules, but the rules aren't clear and cut and they're never going to be. No, I mean, trust me, I, that's like, what happened to me in AA when I started mm. using medical marijuana, it was a huge outrageous debate that I frankly found completely ridiculous from what I understand now it has changed a lot. Cause mm. traditionally a rule is if uh, something is being supervised by a physician or prescribed by a physician, then it's cool. So just drink with your doctor. Well, then you're fine. <laughs> well, this is one way. This is one place where things like, marijuana or ketamine you know alcohol is that you can't go get a prescription for red wine you know even if that might be your way to unwind i have an uncle he'll he'll write it he'll put it on the paper you know? that w- i mean a lot of people we'll don't, my, my partner <laughs> drinks to relax and it's great for him but mm-hmm. cannabis makes him anxious and crazy mm-hmm. you know booze made me super sad and and kind of just a major cunt <laughs> but 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 weed has has really helped me and got me two book deals on the subject. I so I, it is my personal opinion, backed in the research I have done, both personally and professionally, that their approach to recovery is far more individualized than the 12-step approach. But that being said, a great many, many people I respect immensely 
are go, go to AA and that's what works for them and they need that strictness and they need those steps. So it, whatever works for you works for you. Yeah. What was it like growing up in the Caribbean? I, like how do, I guess I'll, what I'm curious about is normally I ask this like parts of the country or when you're in like certain parts of Europe or Canada, but you're, I've never talked to someone who grew up in the Caribbean. What are the attitudes towards sexuality down there? Growing up in the Virgin Islands was, on one hand, you know, like living in paradise, you know, literally after Virgin, school. The Virgin Islands. The did Virgin you, Islands. Did you love your, your shout out during all the impeachment trials? You had Stacey Plaskett up there running things and everyone's like, what are the Virgin Islands? That's ours? Well, we can't. We have representatives, <laughs> but they can't vote. Yeah, so they're there to watch. They're, it's, it's, yeah, don't get me all started on the politics <laughs> of the Virgin Islands or how after two, hur- two Category 5 hurricanes, Donald Trump infamously was like, I'm talking to the president of the Virgin Islands about this, which is him. <laughs> We, he's talking to himself hearing voices <laughs> we have a governor um no it was beautiful it was paradise we did boating trips on the mm. weekends i learned how to sail i lived on the side of a fucking cliff you know and my swim team practice was in the ocean and sometimes dolphin would sw- dolphins would swim next to us but on the other hand you know the reason we swam in the ocean is because we couldn't afford a pool mm. you know poverty is great crime is great there is hurricanes. I've lived, I've lost a house in a hurricane, literally had it crumble around me and been without power for many, many months. So when people ask me that, it's interesting or it's kind of, it, it was so beautiful and paradise, but also very difficult and uncomfortable in a lot of ways that I think were really normal for me, but is why, frankly, a lot of what we call Statesiders are, in the opinion of Virgin Islanders, pussies. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it a cult? Um, is it like culturally similar to the states, or does it is it lean more towards the the way the Caribbean is? It's it's mostly Caribbean. Ninety mm. about roughly ninety percent of the population is Black Caribbean people. You know, I am of the smaller percent of the expat community, and I had or have they're both still alive. Very liberal par- parents who literally quote unquote didn't want to raise their daughter in Reagan's America. <laughs> and so in my family, uh, I wasn't given a lot of, you know, impressions around sex being bad or drugs being bad. And I had a whole lot of freedom, but I do know that aspects of the Caribbean can also be very, very conservative. So I don't, don't know if I can speak to m- more other than myself gotcha gotcha yeah. but generally like not some sort of sex negative household well parts of the Caribbean are very well, religious I meant, you, I meant for you oh yeah. for me no not at all yeah sounds no. like they were like yeah do your thing you mm. want to wave a wand wave a wand no. do y'all use wands i don't know i'm very ignorant on the topic of witches it's why i want to talk to you so badly uh and that's a good time for me to say i'm here with sophie st thomas oh yeah <laughs> she's got a new book Hi. out called sex magic Sex witch. Uh, oh, sorry, sex witch. Ah, I wrote down the phone. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> what is what is a sex witch? Well, I define witch as someone who is aware of their power and not afraid to use it. And so, therefore, a sex witch would be someone who is aware of their sexual power and not afraid to use it, which sounds a little dangerous when I say it out loud, but maybe that's why I like it. <laughs> it's really important and rooted in shaking off shame surrounding sexuality. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you have any shame yourself you had to shake off? Yeah, I I think we all do. You know, I was just talking about friends the other night about how despite how liberal my parents pride themselves on being, I remember getting in so much trouble as a very, very young child because me and my friend stumbled on some porn and then recreated what we saw with my stuffed Mickey Mouse dolls. The, the way... Real Where roller coaster I, I, of emotions I, I w- just then. Would, <laughs> no, so, no, but my mom walked in on us, like, humping these Mickey Mouses, which to me sounds fucking hilarious, but I got in big trouble, but I, I so I do rem- remember that, like, burning feeling of shame surrounding sexuality, but no, I, I've always been a very open sexual person. I went to college in North Carolina, in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, which moving to the South was such a culture shock. And I remember pitching my school newspaper an article because I majored in journalism and wrote back then 
about the benefits of non-monogamy as a way to reduce cheating. Mm -hmm. You know, basically stating that with ethical non-monogamy, people can be honest about their desires and what's going on because the hardest part of cheating for most people isn't so much the physical sex, but the lying and the betrayal and the secrets. And they act, they were, they just like clutched their pearls and like screamed for Jesus and were like, no. Are you comfortable sharing like what year range or what year this is? Yeah, I am 33 and this. This is like in the mid on. In the mid on. Yeah. I graduated in 2010. Okay. Yeah. And you, and so you already were familiar with non-monogamy in college. Yeah, I was. I. How'd that happen? My own curiosity. I, I, I've, I've always been researching and reading about sex and sexuality. Dan Savage is controversial to a lot of people, but I remember, you know, being young and learning what pegging is by reading his column. Mm -hmm. And frankly, yeah, I just, my college boyfriend cheated on me and I thought he was a dumbass and I hated him, but also he was older and had graduated and was living in a city and we were long distance. So I could understand how it happened without taking it personally but i was mostly just so pissed that he had lied to me for months so then i started researching that and that led to the pitching of the ethical non-monogamous article do you remember what it felt like when you first like happened upon this this idea that like people could just be open about wanting to or having sex with other people do I remember how I did or how it made me feel? Like when I first like realized that that was even a concept, it just like clicked in my brain. It was like in a small item in the back of the New York Post. It was like one of those small squares. Don't even remember what the whole piece was, but I remember there was just it just explained what it was. It was uh, they were using the term polyamory, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And it was like, oh, I'm not weird. So that yeah. was my, that was my feeling. Well, I didn't know if you had any sort of revelation when it came in or um, you wrestled with a it. A little. I did. I wrestled with it a lot. Mm -hmm. I When I first moved to New York, I was in a th polyamorous three-year relationship with someone who I'm still very good friends with. And at the time, it was awesome because I had... I knew I was bisexual for a long time, but when I moved to New York right after I graduated, I started dating women for the first time. But then I fell in love with this person. But the idea of not continuing to explore that just felt so limiting mm -hmm. so thankfully he was a poly dude but over the course of the three years i found out that i actually have a very hard time with full-on polyamory which indicates you know not only fucking but loving many people you know i have emotional jealousy you know i would be jealous of the time he spent with other people and the dates and the intimacy but frankly the i as far as like the idea of my partner fucking someone else, that pretty much just turns me on. So then I learned and figured out and have written about a lot that, you know, it's not, again, we talked about gray areas and people being uncomfortable with gray areas and our insistence on binaries. You know, you don't have to be full on completely monogamous or totally poly. Like mm. you have multiple girlfriends or boyfriends and you make time for all of them and no one ever gets jealous. Like some people that's, Either one is perfect, but you you can curate a relationship to whatever is best for you and your partner. I like to describe it as couture rather than off the rack. I like that. The, the couture, yeah. So when I realized and communicate this and found a partner on the same page that I could explore my sexual desires because I am one of those people when if you say, oh, you can only fuck one person for the rest of your life, I just clamp up in <laughs> such terror but I, I also do, you know, want to, to live with someone and have a loving partnership mm -hmm. where there's, you know, loyalty and reliability and shared long term term goals. So my kind of light bulb moment was when I realized that pretty much there's a relationship for every couple. Yeah, I um, for me, like any sort of like big decision my fear with making big decisions is that it could be permanent i don't mm. have tattoos i don't have a con unless the jets win a super bowl i don't have the confidence to pick something i know that i'm going to be there um you know when it, if it comes to look whether or not to move the city any big life decision you know makes me nervous uh so similarly the concept of like you only get to fuck one person the rest of your life once you make that decision for me the terror is what if i made the wrong decision and the wrong person uh what when you clamp up at the thought of monogamy what are you what do you feel like you're clamping up to? I'm just someone who really wants to get the most out of this life as possible. Mm -hmm. I 
have gotten some shit for accidentally saying things about bisexual people and non-monogamy that could be a little problematic. I mean, if anyone's still <laughs> listening to me after 370 plus episodes, you are definitely saying I do. Okay, <laughs> I, I am a pro- I am one of those problematic bisexual people who wants to have sex with both genders. <laughs> you know, thankfully having my primary partner right now being a mostly straight guy, the idea of like, hey, can I have another woman over usually goes over very well. Mm. But just the idea of being with one person, one gender, you know, knowing that would likely mean no sex parties, no opportunities. Once I was in a monogamous relationship and I was invited to engage in a threesome with a couple I was very attracted to Mm -hmm. and I turned it down. And then like a, a week later, me and this girl broke up. And that is like my one sexual regret. You know, I've looked back and I don't really regret any stupid, messy sex I've had, but I regret turning down that threesome. But you've probably had oodles and noodles of threesome since, but you're like, that threesome, I could could have been. Yeah. Well, that threesome was special because I could have been the unicorn, which I actually yeah. rarely am. Usually I'm the pervy couple, you know romancing girls to to join um and i am good at that but yeah but you're no you're right that but that image is just burned into my head i'm like you know what i can't why was the why was what you said before problematic or were you being just silly there is this bisexuals have a reputation of being bad at monogamy Uh so when a bisexual who does want monogamy or is monogamous hears that they find it offensive that you that, that you I would Im- want to do monogamy. That I would imply that Your bisexuals... Your non-monogamy insists that they can't do monogamy. That my non-monogamy and bisexuality are intertwined. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I think people in general get like... They feel like the people who do non-monogamy like us, that just the concept of us doing it threatens their monogamy. As oh, if like, completely. Right. It do- No, I know it does. Yeah, so it's like just in the same way. It's like, well, then if, she, if she's a bisexual who like is not monogamous, then everyone's going to think us bisexuals I kind of assume it's people like not wanting their like boyfriend to figure out that he can be non monogamous <laughs> or something. Right. They're like, oh no, don't get into his head. <laughs> exactly. They're exactly. unsubscribing from Dan Savage every week. <laughs> they, yeah. It's like, stop getting on the phone. <laughs> they put in child blockers for, for polyamory websites. I'm sure they the are. I'm sure they are. <laughs> and then, and, and then how'd you fall into um, sex magic? Like, where, like how'd you first discover that? I first discovered it on my own without realizing I was doing it. Mm -hmm. I was, I would like be coming and like find myself imagining things I wanted, like Mm -hmm. a book deal and maybe myself at my book party Mm -hmm. or more money or the perfect partner. And then just in my own research of the occult world, I started reading about the practice of sex magic and the use of sex, sexual energy. So you energy. already reading about the occult at, at this yes. point. So what got you? Let's, where, where do we first start getting curious about the unknown things? I think in, in general, whether it's kink communities or psychedelic communities, non-traditional approaches to addiction, to witches i i'm always drawn to these weird subcultures Mm. and in the virgin islands there are a lot of really cool and sometimes spooky hoodoo and voodoo traditions and i grew up with things such as my school had a red line drawn around the outside perimeters because it was built you know in this rocky island territory so playgrounds could kind of get into unsafe areas and it was like, if you cross this red line, like these demon ghosts are going to come eat you. So just, just to keep the kids in? Exactly. Exactly. You did know? y'all follow that? Did, yeah, we did, we like, did. did you fall for it? Of, of course we did. I mean, this is like, you know, lower school. This is like, you know, pre, pre-puberty. And so there was a lot of superstitions like that. There would be rumors of, you know, vampire witches who you could see at the, like at a bar with, um, they're blood addicted, you know, sub basically. And so I was familiar with it. And then I moved to New York and I lived in the East Village, really close to the store Enchantments, which is, uh, if you, it's interesting and kind of hardcore and a little intimidating. And they do have, they have an apothecary, they make magic candles, they have books. Anyways, I went in and bought a lot of stuff and started reading. 
And then a few years after that, I became very close with Vice's astrologer, Annabelle Gatt, who knows more about the occult, in particular astrology, than anyone I know, and learned a lot through her, and then just started meeting other people. I, Before I became a full-time writer, I had a day job in TV and would also take side um, film gigs, and I was working on a documentary about the Satanist group called the Satanic Temple, so I became friends with all these Satanists, and it was kind of just it was just through meeting people really yeah do you think the the occult the magic did, did that fill in a role for religion at some point because it doesn't sound like that was integral to your upbringing no i wasn't raised religious and right do you think like this kind of swooped in and filled a space that normally religion would have sat in maybe but i wouldn't put it in those words but i know i think it was a source of power in dealing with my shit like for instance i've seen people freak out at the word tarot for instance like i mean no no one here like no one that you've interviewed or you know in brooklyn (laughs) but say my say my boyfriend's like conservative aunt you know here's the word tarot and she's just like oh and i'm like it's just a fucking meditation tool like i sit down and i meditate and i think about my shit and i look out these cards that represent archetypes of the human experience that we've all had and they help me reflect upon and work through like this horrible anxiety disorder I have that won't shut my brain up or putting all my energy into candle to manifest for me is like I I find there's a lot of powers in ritual it's just Mm -hmm. the act of doing something of writing something out of turning it into something of manifestation that I really dig it's certainly the closest thing I have to a religion but For me, the power isn't so much about calling in outside spirits or different gods or goddesses. It's all about, you know, kind of manifesting my own power. Right, right. But, you know, in in a way, though, like finding power in that in the rituals, like your rituals, like you, whatever ritual you do with a candle, how is that any sillier than showing up on Sunday morning to eat bread and wine with a priest, right? No, it's totally fucking silly. And right. you know what? No, no, but I'm saying it's like it's no more silly than oh, any no, of the rituals no, no, no. than any other well, the organized religions. Well, the Catholics religions. who, like, by the way, today released their statement like, uh, we officially do not like gay people. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> but the Catholics have nailed the ritual and even the glamour. You know, it's like the, I mean, that's a fucking love candle spell over there sitting on that thing. That and, I mean. and that keeps your partner in love with you? Is that? <laughs> you know, I actually made that as part of filming a video promo for Sex Witch where I was like doing some of the spells. So the message that was carved and put into that candle was just fuck me daddy. But yes, it's supposed to be <laughs> it's supposed to look like a, a love spell. It, it sounds like uh, you know, what what you're calling magic is is the the way in which you do it is just another form of inner work of you know, what do they call it? The that movement of just like willing things to be of um oh, it's like, I'm, I forget what it was called. It was big in the 80s where people were just like, no, if you want it, you just manifest it. Oh, yeah. Like the secret type shit. Stuff like that. It just seems yeah. like another type of thing that is harnessing. A, it's trying to harness something from yourself. It is. It also doesn't. And this was a big, important thing to me writing Sex Witch. I was mm-hmm. like, I'm learning all about sex magic and love spells. But I've also been a sex and relationships, excuse me, sex and relationship journalist for a decade and had the opportunity to interview the few people in the world who have a phd and a dissertation on like furries you know or so i have access to all these minds and i've just learned so much like whether i implement them all into my own love life is a different story but i know so much about like how to communicate with your partner how to find the right relationship format for you so when i pitched this book to my publisher i was like i want to write a like book of love and sex spells that will actually work because it's not just you know, put this color candle like in this corner of your apartment on this day of the week during this phase of the moon. It also has communication tips. It has exercises to find out where you fall in the monogamous to polyamory standard. It has information on, you know, gender and STIs and, you know. Oh, God, is there a chlamydia spell to like get away? Like, ah, oh, I can't get the penicillin. Can I just light a candle? Can I manifest that one away? Um. <laughs> You know, that's so funny because it <laughs> if doesn't. If you're about to say yes, I will freak. No, it doesn't. But I did, and not shaming everyone, I, I honestly <laughs> think we all have it. But I dated a guy briefly with herpes and I didn't 
want to get it and someone a witch i know made me a no herpes tincture of all these like antivirals um stuff and did that make you feel more relaxed to then sleep with that person no, I, I mean, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I felt more relaxed sure. because I did my research and he was on Valtrex mm-hmm. and we were using condoms. So the exposure barrier, ex- excuse me, ex- yeah. yeah, incredibly re- low. But yes, I did still use the gotcha. tincture. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. It's just like, like it, it's, I think, what, what, and I do this too. I'm a comic. I hang out with comics. What, what we love to do the most is make fun of things we think are silly, right? Um, and it can be religion, but like it could be. Like witch, Wiccan and witches stuff. It could be the people who like make a vision board. But at the end of the day, it's like if those things are actually causing a lot of good, whatever method you have to do, whether it's go in the mass or the vision board or a or spell. Yeah. Like whatever's like making you feel better about something that's otherwise making you anxious in your life. I think that does good in the world. You know, I think so. It's uh, it's obviously been a positive force for me mm-hmm. um, and continues to be so. Yeah. Hopefully soon I'll get to tell you about my next which book but not yet not yet not yet we're still crafting i don't talk about anything until the ink is dry (laughs) (laughs) until until they're the checks in the bag exactly what's what's your favorite spell well just since i already talked about it there's a tarot spread to find which relationship format is right for you okay that involves uh meditation and there's a lot of information presented um that's quite accessible i hope and you know you draw a tarot card for you and a tarot card for your partner and then a tarot card kind of for you know you and your partner is not child like a a baby but you know the energy you have together and what you want and then there's kind of all these prompts to reflect on that and i I was proud of that one it's fun to do yeah okay and and what, what was your what was yours when you when you first did that God, I don't know. I mean, I could like bring out tarot cards, but I mean, that sounds like a great bonus episode. Yeah, uh, we'll do, <laughs> we, let's we do could. that at the end. <laughs> I I don't remember. It probably said. I mean, if it said the truth, it would say lean more into the sex and not so much the openness and the love of polyamory because you get jealous about emotional things, mm. but not sexual things, Sophie. Yeah, we were talking. You, you were mentioned before, like, yeah, sometimes I feel jealous, and and people sometimes just want to avoid the bad feeling. Mm-hmm. I personally like to embrace like bad feelings because I think bad feelings are what makes good feelings so good. Otherwise, like they would just be baseline, uh, and we wouldn't feel so great. We'd be like, this is just how things are. Um, That's true. That's totally true. I think I think that way with bad experiences. I also don't believe that bad feelings just go. I don't. You know, oppression doesn't work. Mm-hmm. If you have a bad feeling and just decide to ignore it, all it's going to do is like pop up in some other horrible way. Yeah, and I'm not even tapped into any sort of a woo woo like any. I don't have like that spirituality. Uh, but at the same time, like it. it um, balance makes sense to me yeah so if there are good things there's probably going to be at least a chunk of bad things attempting to balance it out and i'll take those to get all this good over here so with jealousy it's like i think a lot of, so many people say when they hear about polyamory or or even just general non-monogamy how do you not get jealous and it's like this assumption like oh well if you feel jealous you can't do it exactly it's like no it's how we handle the jealousy that is so crucial yeah, that's tough with any kind of stigmatized sexual group. It's like how sex workers can't ever complain about their job, you yeah. know? Because it's like, oh, well, then you shouldn't fucking be a whore. <laughs> you know, like, if you... you uh, who says polyamory is perfect? It's not perfect. Mm-hmm. But, like, if you're in a monogamous relationship, you're allowed to bitch about whatever is going on. So uh, it's, My dumpy husband just keeps playing Xbox exactly. in the basement. All right, then leave him. I don't, or, or go fuck somebody else. What? Oh, that's not an answer. Well, then I. It's fine. It can be an answer. You can just you just have to completely hide it <laughs> and feel really guilty about it. Right. Well, you could have an open, honest conversation. Be like, hey, like we haven't been intimate together for six months. That's not really working for me. Like, can we talk? And if it sounds like you know getting the frequency up isn't going to really work, can we find a way for me to indulge elsewhere? Yeah. Like, there's. Uh, I think yeah, people let the jealousy part really scare them off like how you you admit you experience jealousy when you feel jealous like how do you handle that what's that internal monologue like oh, or the can, or the candle spell i don't know how you handle no it. <laughs> i mean i mean i'm usually i i am good at communicating if anything sometimes i think i say too much so 
I have found that jealousy can usually kind of, we can learn a lot from it. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look about, okay, why is this person or this situation making me jealous when this one doesn't? Yeah. You know, and if it's like, oh, well, I'm jealous about like their work, maybe this pinpoints like a source of insecurity I have about my own career that I should be honest about. Which probably was there regardless of completely who your partner's fucking. Completely. Right? And if it's something like a jealousy that feels warranting of a conversation, like, hey, you talk about your ex just a little bit too much. You know, I am I am very comfortable <laughs> going there. <laughs> that's that's a me. That's that's a my mistake. Yeah, I do that. You men like that. Uh, well, I mean, also not for none. I did start a podcast where I started interviewing my exes. So oh, that's in my defense. That's awesome. God, oh God, I don't. I, 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 you're a brave man, is all I have to say. Um, I'm a glutton for self punishment, <laughs> but I'm, I'm learning to take. Ooh, <laughs> well, might I mean, need some of that medical marijuana. Thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, is there is there an ex that you uh, would be terrified to interview? Or is there an ex that you would be deeply curious to interview? Both. But can you share both of those? Which one do you want first? Let's, let's do the one you're scared of so then we can recover from she it. She might be listening to this. That's why I'm scared of her. Gosh, I hope. I could use the downloads. No. It's like <laughs> <laughs> um, trying to catch up the damn. It was Sorry. just a sad breakup that didn't go well. She's also in media and editorial world which i learned a valuable lesson on about the power of subtweets and maybe don't go there again oh yeah you, well, don't, we, you don't want blue check marks subtweeting each other it can get messy <laughs> yeah especially when we have like the same editors um yeah that and we have we tried to meet up for like a friendly coffee when i'm was in my current relationship mm. and it, it did not go well why didn't it go well because she started crying immediately How'd that make you feel? Honestly, uncomfortable, but not, and I didn't feel guilty. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I, I, I was unprepared to deal with that emotion, I guess. Yeah. So if she were listening, um, what would you, what would you ask her? I would say that nothing, neither of us did anything wrong, mm -hmm. but I, sh I think she's a wonderful and incredible person, but we were obviously incompatible. Mm -hmm. And that breaking up was the right thing to do, but that doesn't mean that I'm condemning her and my current relationship doesn't mean that I'm condemning her mm -hmm. and that I hope she meets someone fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. It's very gracious of you. It's true. Right. It's completely true. Well, who would you be insanely curious to interview and why? And, uh, and ultimately, I will come back and say, what it was that you would want to ask them or ask them? Oh, God. I had a uh, boyfriend who I loved very much. He was a Syrian immigrant. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of, in, during a, a early in Trump's presidency, I remember when he bombed Syria while we were out to dinner. Anyways, there was a lot of political and f family shit that got in the way, but it felt like one of those situations where we broke up for reasons outside of our control rather than any like lack Did of get, love like, deported no thankfully and i don't even really know where he is right now because okay. he's not on social media but again i have nothing for love for him but i would just be curious what he thought about the whole thing so we never really it talked sounds like about it was... the breakup after it happened yeah and and why was the why did y'all break up it was just the family stuff yeah i've <laughs> I frankly feel bad elaborating on it too much. That's okay. You um, don't but I don't. It bec it became apparent that a long term future together, you know, anything involving like marriage yeah. Yeah. was out of the question. And mm -hmm. so he was basically like, we can't go any further. This is what I can give you. And I was like, yeah, I can't do that with sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if in different circumstances, who knows type of thing. Exactly. Is marriage something you would want? I actually think marriage can be very romantic. You know, when I say that, I mean, I don't want to be monogamous and um, I don't want to be married in a church and I would never wear white, but... I'd be wearing my black cloak surrounded <laughs> by my, my coven. Precisely. Exactly. Precisely. <laughs> 
Oh my god, I've got I've been to some weddings like that actually. I could tell you <laughs> oh, about them. Yes. No, please, what please. wedding slash orgy complete what? with a blood exchange ritual. Wow, there's like a lot to unpack right there. Mm-hmm. I thought we just had you had one great thing, you had a second great thing with the orgy, and then you had the blood ritual. There's even I'm more like, great things. Oh my. I yeah, a Tell wedding. Us about which weddings? Of a fr- of friends of me and my partners. It was a couple that we actually somehow both knew before we got together and then went to their wedding. Which involved fabulous black clothing. Okay. It was led by a witch wearing all red. Naturally. There was a moment where they took a knife. They both sliced open their left hands, representing the left-hand path, which is the path of Satan, in case you don't know. What's the right-hand path? That's the like the hand Jesus likes. Uh, I'm a lefty, so I'm fucked. Oh, yeah. You're evil. <laughs> to, well, You're Twitter evil. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And they exchanged blood along with vows, and then ecstasy was offered. And the like someone going around with a pillow. Just mean, would you would you like some or a tray? literally that? And the groom was doing it. <laughs> and their wedding cake was an array of desserts laid out on a beautiful naked woman's body that you ate off with your mouth. Um, this was up in the penthouse of a gorgeous hotel, so people started having sex on beds. Uh, it was and per- in the wedding invitation, does it say like, and this is the orgy portion? Like, this is the dance time where we got the DJ. <laughs> there, and then here's where we have dinner. And then like, we take our clothes off at 1130. They use, see, the goths are so, what's the word for it? Extra? Extra, <laughs> yes. You know, so of course the the wording was all like, we invite you to a decadent ceremony of non-traditional delights, you know, and you were like, okay, orgy. <laughs> but no, my, my, my boyfriend who I now live with, but had only been dating for a few months at a time, went down on me and then popped his head up and told me he loved me for the first time. And it was so romantic and so lovely. And I'm so glad I was invited to that wedding. See, I also I also dropped an I love you at a sex party. It didn't. <laughs> I don't know if I've, I forget if I've told this tonight. If I have, it's been a long time. I, I told Tell it. My, my now ex, I told her I loved her at a Hacienda party. Ooh. Um, that's that's the crew I roll with. Nice. Um, I, I need to spend more time with them. Oh, they're great. And you know what they didn't do? They didn't throw sex parties during COVID. It was great. <laughs> that's what that's what I've heard. <laughs> that's so, so I. Uh, no, we she uh, she picked up this uh, cute woman. We start we had like a fun threesome. She went to go pee after like the first round, and and then like at one point she was on top of me, and I just told her I was like I said I love you, Aww. but she didn't hear me. Oh no! So I, she didn't really respond like the way you would hope someone would respond or negatively. Just there wasn't really a response. There was no to response because she didn't hear. It. It's a loud, it's a loud orgy. There's a DJ and I didn't say it loudly enough. When our friend came back, we went back to having a threesome, but I was very self-conscious the whole time. Aww. Cause I was like, okay, I just, I said the words things and, um, you know, didn't get anything back. So when this threesome is done, we might need to have a conversation. <laughs> Did you have the conversation? Yeah, I think we did. I forget if it was like that night or like uh, a day or two later. But like, I was like, hey, by the way, I said, did you hear what I said? And she was like, no. I was like, oh, damn. I told you I loved you. And <laughs> Aww. <laughs> yeah, I, I apparently. But I guess the setting was not as appreciated. Oh, really? Um, but like, I thought it was romantic after you have a threesome at a sex party surrounded by people fucking and you're just like looking in someone's eyes and say, I love you. Well, that's, that's my style. is always that's my style. so beautiful, too. That seems like a nice setting for it. Yeah, there's always like a nice fun theme. Exactly. I, I think she was dressed as like, a, you know, kind of like a, a forest goddess type. Sounds um, right. Yeah, like a, like a Mayan goddess. It's pretty great. How did you manifest this guy? Oh, Tinder. T- <laughs> hey, I know we do spells and incantations, but, you know, we're all using Well, Tinder, Tinder. is pretty magical. I never would have met him you know, he's not from my, like, Brooklyn media scene. Yeah. He was, I I love that I was allowed to meet him in this way. I think, I'm, I've had a lot of relationships and a lot of partners, and I've been through enough breakups not to make any premonitions about this one, but I do feel that as I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot better about being in a relationship mm. and realizing that it's not all just, buzzy sexual chemistry and that's all you need and then everything's going to be fine you know you have to allow different opinions you have to listen you have to be patient you have to take care of the person you have to 
be a grown up and really work on making it work. And then hopefully that hot sex energy keeps happening. And I feel like I was just messier when I was younger in particular, my early and mid twenties. And I do believe, you know, I met someone special for me, but I also believe that I am in a place in my life where I'm able to show up and be there and sustain the relationship. Whereas I was kind of just a hot mess, you know, a decade ago. Well, what's something you feel like, what's a specific aspect of dating, of being in a loving relationship that you think you have uh, gotten better at over the years? Hmm. I would say I don't push for things. Hmm, God, I have so many answers to that question. You can also answer it with more than one thing. Like, we love growth and change at this show. I have to do it all the time because look at my face. Of course I do. So, like, uh, we we love to hear, uh, you know, things we get better at. I have gotten better at accepting if my partner disagrees with me Mm -hmm. and not taking it personally or just, you know, bringing out a metaphysical baseball bat and like whacking them with my opinion hoping it's gonna force them into it okay you know unless it's like you know a rule breaker like i'm a trump voter or i hate gays you know unless you're arguing about like black lives matter as long as it's a respectable opinion just different than mine i'm now able to agree to disagree which can be really really hard to do (sighs) Yeah, I feel you because I'm usually right. So like, <laughs> and that's what my boyfriend says, <laughs> right? And so, and so, like, you know, agreeing to disagree when you know they're wrong is so tough. But like, we learn to do it. <laughs> yeah, we do. So I would say that I would say events. I used to, if I was into something mm-hmm. or someone, rush into living together or saying I love you or whatever relationship milestone we can mark where now I've won learned to just kind of trust that you can't just force everything like right away like if it's gonna happen it's going to happen but that requires time Mm. how do you think you like went through like how do you feel like how did that happen that you oh just making mistakes yeah you know just rushing into living together and having it blow up in my face or pushing someone into something and having it blow up in my face and realizing like okay maybe I should slow down a little bit and mm. let them have their I don't know I'm trying to think of a good example let, let, let them differ ever so slightly with me on the Israel versus Palestine debate you know oh. which I don't want to crack open sure but. I mean hey you want to know my stance <laughs> it's the stance of the last person who told me about the issue because like I really don't know um, yeah I'm just like I don't want to be yelled at. no matter which side I say it's, I get yelled at it's funny I've been on like like I've been in relationships where I've been like yelled at for being too Palestine and other relationships where I've been yelled at for being too Israel and I'm just like you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you do you think magic um, has aided your your self improvement over the last decade or so? Probably. Also, I promised you, right? I promised you on your just a li- just a yeah, little yeah, right here, your, or other side. Well, my right, yeah, you're right. Just, yeah, there my, you go. He's telling me that I have red lipstick on my she face. She promised. She made me promise to tell her if it happened. So. I feel like I'm being kind of a disappointing witch with these witch questions. I know. I'm just, well, I'm just curious about it because it's, like I said, it's one of the few topics I've known about for the course of doing this podcast that I've really never gotten anyone where I could ask the things. I don't know. It's just so fun to me. What, what did you have to like research or learn in the course of writing the book or was it really just putting out what you had already gathered, um, you know, personally? I guess doing research on things like, I'm not super interested in all the herbs and their powers and what they can do, but I know that a lot of people are, especially people who might be buying my book. So a lot of research on which good herbs are good to calm anxiety or which are supposed to encourage lucid dreams, which was really interesting. And I was glad I learned, but you know, I'm not a big herbal witch. Okay. You know, I included cannabis, of course, because it is a magical herb. Very. Um, and there's other things I was interested in a lot, like tarot, but I had never really sat down and studied kind of from a professional standpoint. Mm-hmm. And so that was really cool because I got to 
learn all about so much more about this thing I was already doing and loving and also, you know, have something to send my editor. <laughs> Anything like surprise you? Be like, oh, I had no idea about the 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 King of Cups card. King of Cups is great. Is that a card? Oh, man, I thought it really? was great. Really? That's, like, that's a reaching. really good king to be. <laughs> And why is that? Uh, wait, uh, wait, ask the question before that Sorry. again first. What was it? Um, um, was there just anything in your research oh. that surprised you where like it really elevated your understanding? Yeah. So I was. it was very important to me to be super gender inclusive in this mm -hmm. because some of the older witch communities, you know, the, I'm just going to be fucked up, you know, the like hairy pussy, like turfy, like witches who are like wait, only moon what? cycle people out here. I didn't even know that was an archetype. Oh, yeah. That's a total I archetype. I didn't know that turfs typically have hairy pussies. Because I don't well, these, hook these, up with these turfs. These turfy so. witches, I, be I bet they do. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a hairy pussy, but if you're a turf, there is. You know, so I wanted to make it clear to all of my non-binary or trans friends that you are welcome. But I also, frankly, really wanted to make cis men welcome I was about to ask because this uh, this comes up not just within say a coven, but we can use this that container to explain it. But I do find that there are spaces where whether it's like an open mic or a book club or uh, even like a group chat that sometimes they'll really they'll be like this is for women and feminine identifying people and non-binary. Basically, it's like you're just trying to say not cis not, men, I know. which like at, I think it's one less syllables and just clearer to just say not cis men. I I won't I won't get mad. I just it's it's more clarifying to me um, is is a coven in your mind a similar situation where it's this is for people who are in cis men. Obviously, anyone can or make where their does cis men factor in. If I want at all. cis. I want anyone there. Okay. Like I, if we're going to be like done with gender, I want to like go all the fucking way. And in cis men really. I know, I know all the, all the privilege associated with it, but there's also just so much shit, like the way you guys are taught to process emotions and express emotions and deal with your masculinity. And it's, it's, it's like this horrible, like very rigid conservative box and you're getting punished for all of these things. But if we keep you totally out of the space in the conversation, I feel like there's no room for that to change and expand. You know, and I, then your space also then partially can, can just become a shit on men space, which shitting on men can be very fun. But like, do you want it to be that time consuming? And <laughs> if you want to shit on men, go shit on men. Maybe either they need to hear it or like I respect individual free rights. If the cis man present doesn't like it, he can get up and leave. Sure. But I, I I would want any anyone in my coven. And I found a lot of beautiful ways in magic in particular, the tarot to discuss feminine the divine feminine and the divine masculine which are themes that come up a lot in magic but in a way that are relatable to everyone you know just assuming that we all possess these traits the masculine being associated with mars swords and the sun which is in all penetration and action and doing and then the divine feminine, which is like the high priestess card and the moon and silver is about, you know, and the element water is about receiving and the goddess Venus and openness and emotions. And to, to dictate like you only get the emotions, but you only get like the actions was ridiculous to me. So when I saw just so clearly represented in the tarot through all these different cards that we all contained all this stuff, it became very easy to write about write about it from a magical perspective, and that was very cool. Mm. So how does the magic community need to be more inclusive uh, in, in ways that you talk about in your book? Well, I, for one, think, like, as a basic, if someone... I, I mean, the, the turf's got to got, got to go. How did you how did you talk about gender uh, in regards to magic in your book? I just kind of out I just laid out the archetypes, mm -hmm. kind of as I was describing earlier, using whether it was planets in astrology, Venus that men are from Mars, women are. From, it's funny how, how all this stuff comes up in pop culture so much that then you start studying the cult and you're like, oh, this is like some witchy like astrology <laughs> shit. And with the saying, look, we all have these qualities, mm -hmm. different people have different amounts of these qualities, but here they are. Yeah. 
And it sounds like your book like is really mixing in like, you know, the um, the magic, the herb stuff, the tarot, but with your experience giving advice, uh, you know, and, and writing about these topics. Uh, how do you feel like those two things blended together? How, how, how were you? Uh, how was that process of, of mixing like practical advice with like almost recipes? Sometimes just on the spell format, it could be a little bit restrictive just because you don't if someone sees, you know, two and a half pages as like a step on a spell, they might want to skip over it. So I'm excited for opportunities to write about this stuff in longer form. Mm-hmm. But I think I did a good job. All right. I, I, I got a copy. I can't wait to read myself. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's next up on the queue. Um, <laughs> uh, right I now. can't wait. Yeah. Um, one last thing I want to ask is what's like a bit, what's a misconception about witches that you wish you could dispel, but for some reason there is no spell for that? Huh. What do we have wrong about witches? <laughs> Honestly, I wish witches could could be a little scarier. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone is like, we don't worship Satan. We don't, like, mash up babies. We don't go to orgies. We meditate and work with herbs and work for the better of the whole community and i want to be like yeah yeah, some people you can be a little evil like (laughs) you want to be radical you're like stop being such a centrist witch no well (laughs) it's not radical it's just that it does exist within the community and i like honesty i meant like more like they sound like they want to try to be easier for mainstream to accept and you're like fuck that we're gonna be who we are exactly our I mean, in the coven I go to, there is no blood involved at all. Sure. But I, I know people who do shit like that. Is so. the coven like a weekly meeting? It was monthly, but Month- then COVID started and it right. turned to ver- virtual. But like if someone's listening and be like, oh, I want to start a coven. Like it's like it's a meeting. Like what happens at the meeting? I feel like this is AA again. I don't think I'm allowed to tell you. Oh, you can't? Oh, <laughs> that's such a great way to bookend. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Sophie, uh, and you're allowed to say no if you want. Do you, do you, would you enjoy doing like a little tarot bonus episode yeah. where we'll do a, a reading thing? I don't even know what I'm asking for, but like I trust you. I would love with a to. Deck of cards. Um, for now, where can people find you, find your books? You've written some books on, on cannabis and sexuality. Is that right? Yes. I've written two books on cannabis and then Sex Witch. So, the best place to follow me for all of it is on Twitter and Instagram because I also would like some more followers. My handle is at the Bowie Cat. That's T H E Bowie as in David Bowie, and Cat as in the feline. <laughs> I always like I've I've always enjoyed your uh, your handle. Yeah, me too. I've had that for a long time, like pre rider days, but I'm sticking with it. All right, all right, yeah. Uh, yeah fo- follow her on those uh, those platforms. I'll have a link to the book. Uh, in the show notes if you want to get it at a uh, an independent bookstore near y'all. Uh, but for now, Sophie, why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Toil, toil, boil in trouble. Is that? That's not how it says. It's double, double toil in trouble. No, that's a, that's a Mary Kay and Ashley movie. I can't find what it's supposed to say here. But folks, sex witches, they're real right? Oh, that was, you know, we have not heard this perspective yet. And I would love to know what your thoughts, reactions, maybe you have some experience casting spells yourself. Uh, Tell us your coven tales over in the champagne room, which is our super free, super sex positive, super supportive discord server. Uh, You'll find a link for that in the show notes. There will be a channel dedicated to episode 376 with Sophie St. Thomas. Uh, You can also let me know what you thought about this week's show on our various social media channels. Hey, I'm not going to list them all off to you. It's probably at the Billy Presida, unless it's Instagram, where I'm at Billy is Presida. Link in the show notes, folks. We flying through. Um, and if you enjoy my conversation with Sophie St. Thomas, if you want to hear her, give me a tarot reading. Folks, I was incredibly surprised, and she pulled one card that suggests I will be having quite the wild and fun time with hopefully uh, a couple beautiful people uh, in the near future. If tarot is real, (laughs) you can hear that bonus episode uh, exclusively on Patreon, as well as over 
200 bonus episodes and you can gain access to those and more at patreon.com slash man podcast that's patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash man podcast uh to, to, next you're not gonna want to miss next week because next week is the glory hole cast it's been a while since we've had one of my uh my past partners on here uh and maybe current partner and let's you know we're gonna hear from her next week but for now Stay slutty. It's the vibrator that has no equal. And now, Motor Bunny offers their thrusting sex machine, the Motor Bunny Buck. Enjoy a fan whore discount at manwhorepod.com slash motorbunny or use promo code MANHOR at checkout.